Good morning and welcome to Fredericksburg United Methodist Church. My name is Anna Billingsley and I'm one of the lay leaders here. We're so glad you're joining us today. We hope that you'll register your attendance with us and let us know any prayer request you have. You can do so on the form on our online worship page. Parents of kids and youth, we have some good news. Our beloved Kids with Purpose program is going digital. The program will begin on January 20th, which is this Wednesday. Email Jillian Murray for more information. Also, youth, don't miss out on virtual gaming on Friday nights. Connect with David Carrier to get hooked in. And please take note of the following items. We are putting in-person worship on hold for a few weeks. This decision was made by the pastors in connection with our Healthy Church team after receiving guidance from local health officials. We're paying close attention to the caseloads of COVID-19 and the surge that we're experiencing right now in this area. So we'll keep you posted, but please continue to pray with us for all of our frontline workers, for the vaccine to roll out quickly and effectively, and for all of the people that are making decisions about worship. We hope to get back to worshiping in person in God's house very soon. As announced last week, the church's charge conference related to the 2021 budget will be held by Zoom this Wednesday, January 20th at 7 p.m. All members are invited to participate. Lay delegates and church council have voting capabilities. Check your midweek Fredericksburg United Methodist Church email for the Zoom link. Today is Human Relations Sunday. We join other United Methodist congregations in a special offering to support neighborhood ministries through community developers, community act advocacy through United Methodist Voluntary Services and work with at-risk youth through the Youth Offender Rehabilitation Programs. Please support this ministry by designating Human Relations Sunday on your offering today. Holy Communion will be a part of today's service and you can check our online worship page for details on how to prepare your elements if you're unfamiliar with this process. In addition, we're offering drive up communion from 12 to 1.15 this afternoon at the Charlotte Street Circle. Again, we're so glad you're joining us today. Prepare your hearts to hear a powerful message and uplifting music. As I mentioned, today is Human Relations Sunday and we're marking the birthday of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. In that spirit, please join me in our call to worship. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. As we gather in this place, allow your spirit to fill our very being. As we worship today, we remember our brothers and sisters who are worshiping elsewhere throughout the world. Inspire each of us to work more faithfully for justice and dignity of life everywhere. Raise our vision above the barriers of color, culture, and creed that separate us. Give us wisdom as we deal with one another. Help us to recognize and to respect different ways rather than to judge. In the spirit of Jesus, who came not to be served, but to serve, we now must walk in the world. We must reach out our hands with help and open our hearts in love. Awake in us the desire to seek your way of serving you in the world. Amen. Now we will have our opening hymn, Precious Lord, Take My Hand, number 474 in the United Methodist Hymnal. Let me stand, I am tired. 
Good morning, everybody. My name is Jillian Murray, and I'm the Children's Ministry Director at Fredericksburg United Methodist Church, and I will be giving you your children's message right now. So right now we're going to talk about something that's a little bit gross. Now, how many of you have had a runny nose or a cold or allergies? Probably everybody, right? I'm sure you don't like feeling like that, where your nose is running and it's stuffed up and you can't breathe. So what do you do when you need to unstuff your nose? What do you do when you need to clean it out or clear it all out? You use a tissue, right? So a simple box of tissues is really good to have on hand, especially in the winter months. But when we have a cold or allergies and our noses are running, we need a tissue to help clear it out. And if you're younger, your moms and dads probably help you blow your nose. And if you're older, of course, you can do it yourself. So maybe you take some medicine and you blow your nose and it feels a lot better, right? It feels like it's been cleaned out and we can breathe again. So in today's scripture story, Jesus has started his life's work or what we call his ministry. And so Jesus's ministry is to teach people how to pay attention to God, how to love God and how to serve God. And Jesus had to go do that in a variety of different places. Sometimes he had to talk to people who really weren't serving God the way that they should. And he had to do that in places um, that might not have been considered to be very holy. So today's story that we'll be hearing, he had to go into a place called the temple. And there were people in that temple who really just wanted money and maybe they wanted power. So they were just a little bit greedy. And Jesus did not like that. So Jesus had to clean it out. Just like our noses get kind of stuffed up with the yucky stuff, Jesus had to go into the temple and clean it out of all the yucky stuff that was happening in there too. So he didn't do that, of course, with a tissue, but he did it with his words and his actions because Jesus was very, very, very um, special and he was able to um, tell people about God and they listened to him. So this is a great example of how we now as Christians today can live our lives and clean it out of all of the things that might keep us from a wonderful and loving relationship with God. I hope you all have a great Sunday and enjoy your day. Brothers and sisters in Christ, as we come to our time of prayer this week, we come with many things on our hearts and minds. We come with the events in our nation in the recent weeks since January 6th, also in this week's impeachment of our president, so much, COVID rates rising, concerns for our community. We come in light of God's grace and we just offer up all that we have and all of who we are. Within our community here, we extend our sympathies and we remember the family of Trish and Bob Vaughn in the death of Trish's aunt, Helen Foley. We also remember those with ongoing health concerns, especially Betty Monroe, Brian Brandt, and Carl Wilson. And then among us, um, we also celebrate joys. Our preschool opened uh, successfully this past week. So what a joy to have uh, children 
back in our church again and that preschool functioning well. Also, we celebrate the joys of um, members and frontline workers beginning to receive vaccines here in our community. And our teachers, our frontline workers of all sorts that are risking themselves in this time. We just give thanks. Our prayer, I will begin today with a prayer from the Discipleship Ministries of the United Methodist Church for today for a celebration of Human Relations Sunday, also in light of the coming celebration of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King's ministry. Let us hear and let us join in prayer. Speak, Lord, for your children are listening. For a word of encouragement, for a word of instruction about how we ought to live in these troubled times. Speak, Lord, for your children are listening. As we drift off in sleep at night in our nicely covered beds, in nice places or in the sawdust of padded beds, on dusty floors, we are listening. We are listening rich and poor. We are listening young and old. We are listening black and white for a word from you that will heal our land. Eternal God, lover of all of our souls, we come to you this morning hungering for something from you that will change the rest of our lives. We come hungering for honesty instead of corruption, for generosity instead of greed. We come hungering for integrity instead of intrigue. We come hungering for our neighbors to be fed and for all to have enough for all to have honest work to provide for their basic needs for their families. We come this morning also, Lord, hungering for righteousness, to flow like rainwater, and for justice like an ever-flowing stream, so well described by your prophets. We come, Lord, hungering and listening for words to us, describing how we can participate in your great work of redemption, of recreation. We come listening for ways that we can become a part of the solution and not a part of the problem. We come listening in fear and trembling, praying that we all will have the courage to respond and act if we hear a clear word of instruction from you. So speak to us, Lord, this morning. Pour over us, Lord, in these days with the power of your Spirit. Ignite within us something that rises beyond our partisanship, that rises beyond our own allegiances to only allegiance to you, to your word, to all that is holy, and most of all, to your Son, Jesus Christ, for all who are weary, for all who are troubled and frustrated, to all who are hurting and grieving, Lord, bring comfort. Guide us as the people of God in this place and guide your church universal in the ways of Jesus and nothing more. Help us, Lord, to keep in sight your vision your vision for a reality that is inbreaking in the here and now that causes us to rise, to rise with you in the way of our beloved Christ. We pray this prayer, not just for our land, Lord, not just for our lives, but for all of creation. We pray this in the powerful name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. my joy to share with you today a little bit about work I've been a part of in being a member of the Ministers for Social Change. 
it had its origin out of our planning district here uh, with the work from uh, Reverend Dr. Charles Wormley with Mount Zion Baptist Church in Spotsylvania. He put out a call after the death of George Floyd and the subsequent protest and uh, sadness and response that we saw in our nation and community for church leaders to come together, for pastors and ministers across different races, different denominations and ages to come together and to do something as the family of Christ, to stand against injustice, to promote anti-racism in our culture, in our church, and to work together as the family of God. I have been blessed to be a part of the leadership group working alongside Dr. Wormley and others in the way of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King that we celebrate and look to his work in the week to come. For churches to rise together and to seek for ways for us to become what King dreamed of as being beloved community, a family in Christ, working together, getting to know one another, sharing together in ways that are transformative and form deep and lasting bonds. And it's been my joy to be a part of this group, to work in the beloved community groups that you're gonna hear about today, and for us to see that our church will become a part of future groups and the future of this work in our community to help make a change. Let's take a look and I hope that you will ask some questions and pray for the work of our group and the work of all of those that are, that are committed to the way of Christ and standing together as a human family uh, in these times and in the times to come. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Bill Potts. I'm a lifelong Methodist and a member of Fredericksburg Methodist since the late 1980s. Growing up in the 1960s, I was attracted to Methodism because it was a faith that stood up for racial and social justice. In my early 20s, I was blessed to live and work in a poor, segregated African-American community as a VISTA volunteer in service to America. In the summer of 2020, I was blessed with an invitation from Pastor Gina joined the first beloved community group of the Ministers for Social Change. I've learned from that group experience that I, and indeed all Methodists, must continue to fight for racial and social justice using our Christian love and our Christian grace to defeat hate and injustice. I believe we must reach out to our black brethren, attend their church services, support their just causes, and love others all others, including both overt and unintentional racists, until they understand God's Word. Hello, I'm Jillian Murray, and I was asked to be part of the beloved community group, and for several months I would sit at my desk at home on my computer on Wednesday evenings with people who at first were strangers, and then they became friends, and then I would even say we all became family. So our lead pastors began each session with usually a video, we'd have prayer time, and then we would discuss the issues of racism within our world, within our communities, and even within our churches. So what I enjoyed and what I needed to hear were the different perspectives and experiences that each person had. So as a white person from a very white state of Maine and a very white upbringing, I simply really needed to listen and listen to the pain and the frustration and the longing for justice that was expressed by the various um, local black faith leaders in the group. So over time, we each gained an understanding of one another, and we even referred to each other as family, which was really a lovely thing. Uh, we inspired one another to continue the work of letting everybody know that we are made in God's image, that we are all God's children, and that is the work of the beloved community. One of the lessons that I've learned from being a part of our beloved community is how we can strengthen our Christian relationships across our racial lines. And I think one of the ways that we do that is by listening to one another's stories. We are then able to share uh, our stories of how God came into our lives. And through listening and sharing, we can then uh, search with one another uh, for where the Holy Spirit is leading us into deeper relationship with Christ and one another. I am so grateful to be a part of this beloved community and am looking forward to more listening, sharing, and searching with my brothers and sisters. 
As we continue our remembrance of the birthday of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., I ask you to join me in prayer for all people of all the earth, that justice and peace and unity will reign among us all. Would you pray with me? We remember the conviction of Martin Luther King Jr. that freedom is never voluntarily given by the oppressor. It must be demanded by the oppressed. Therefore, let us pray for courage and determination by those who are oppressed. We remember Martin's warning that a negative peace which is in the absence of tension is less than a positive peace, which is the presence of justice. Therefore, let us pray that those who work for peace in our world may cry out for justice first. We remember Martin's insight that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. Therefore, let us pray that we may see nothing in isolation, but may know ourselves bound to one another and to all peoples under heaven. We remember Martin's lament that the contemporary church is often a weak, ineffectual voice with an uncertain sound. It is often the arch supporter of the status quo, far from being disturbed by the presence of the church. The power structure of the average community is consoled by the church's silent and often vocal sanction of things as they are. Therefore, let us pray that neither this congregation nor any congregation of Christ's people may be silent in the face of wrong, but that we may be disturbers of the status quo when that is God's call to us. We remember Martin's hope that dark cloud, the dark clouds of racial prejudice will soon pass away and the deep fog of misunderstanding will be lifted from our fear-drenched communities and in some not too distant tomorrow, the radiant stars of love and brotherhood will shine over our great nation with all their scintillating beauty. Therefore, in faith, let us commend ourselves and our work for justice to the goodness of Almighty God. It is in his Son's holy name that we pray. Amen. As we continue to worship with our tithes and offerings, there are several ways you can share your gifts. A link to the church's give page will be shared in the chat on the side of your screen. You can click on this link to share your tithes and offerings through PayPal, text to give and the Simple Church app. You're also welcome to mail your tithes and offerings or to bring them by the church office Monday through Friday from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. And please remember that if you want to support the Ministries of Human Relations Sunday, please designate so in your offering.
Dear Heavenly Father, we know there is nothing we can give that would equate to what you have provided us. Please accept these gifts, humbly offered from our hearts. Lord, we are experiencing tumult in our personal lives and in our nation. We trust that you have a plan and that the Holy Spirit is present in all that is occurring. We look to you to hold each of us, and especially our leaders, in your gracious and generous hands. We pray for peace and healing. In your precious Son's name, amen. Good morning. This week is the second week of our New Year's sermon series from the Gospel of John titled Framing Life, Jesus as a Point of Reference for a Better Year. Last week, Pastor Gina spoke from the story of Jesus' baptism in John chapter 1. Her central theme was the transformative work of, that God does in believers' lives in through the waters of baptism. This week, we want to spend some time in John chapter 2 with Jesus and his disciples in the temple and focus on what we must do to do our part in God's work of transformation in our lives. Reframing a relationship with God isn't just about cleaning up. Sometimes it's about cleaning out. Would you please stand as you are able as we hear this reading from the Gospel of John, which comes from John chapter 2, verses 12 through 22. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, Take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? And Jesus answered them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, this temple has been under construction for 46 years, and you will raise it up in three days. But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken, the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, as we come before you today, we ask that you open our hearts and our minds to your word, that you help us to identify and to clean out of our lives those things which would separate us from you. Lord, we ask that as we study together, that our hearts would be one of, of one accord and that you would draw us ever nearer to yourself that the meditations of our hearts would be pleasing to you. And all this we ask in Jesus' holy name. Amen. As Jesus and his disciples entered the temple that day, I doubt anyone expected what was coming. As they entered and surveyed the temple, it appeared to be business as usual. The Jewish festival of Passover was in progress. Worshippers from all over the known world had made the pilgrimage to offer sacrifices, offer prayers, and fellowship with other believers and celebrate their identity as the chosen people of God. To accommodate so many foreign visitors to the festival, temple authorities streamlined their operations. They brought money changers in to change foreign money bearing images which could not be used in the temple, for currency used 
for purchasing animals for sacrifices. Animals were brought in so that they would be handy and available to pilgrims for the sacrificial rites. The temple courts, especially the outer court, the court of the Gentiles, where those who were curious about God were allowed to gather, had become a noisy marketplace designed to make it possible for the temple to operate as efficiently as possible during the festival. The business of the temple, the business of God, appeared to be booming. And I imagine the religious leaders of Jerusalem were pleased with their success. But I can't help but wonder if when Jesus entered the temple that Passover, he flashed back to that day when he was a boy of 12, that day when the young Jesus' parents found him in the temple and chastising, chastised him for getting lost and causing them to worry for three days as they searched for him. Jesus had been in the temple learning from the lost scribes and teachers, asking tough questions and displaying wisdom and insight beyond his years. When his parents came to collect him, Jesus seemed surprised that they did not know that he had to be in his father's house. And this may not be the best translation of that phrase, since several English versions render that as that Jesus was saying he was about his father's things or about his father's business. And you can see that there's a definite contrast here between what is going on, what has become temple business, and what Jesus perceived to be his father's business. In any case, what Jesus saw that day clearly angered him. And though none of what was happening in all the buying and selling and money changing in the hubbub of the temple during the festival was necessarily bad or wrong, it had become self-focused. It had become self-serving, and it had become, begun to come between the people and God. And this was particularly true of those who most wanted, most sought to connect with God on that day. The people who were gathered in the court of the Gentiles, the non-Jews, the God-fearers who came just to be near God and to learn about who he was and his ways. And, of course, the poor were excluded, who couldn't afford to participate in the rites. It made Jesus angry. In making a whip of cords, he drove out the cattle and the sheep and the doves, the buyers and the sellers and money changers, totally disrupting what passed for the business of God. This brought to a halt all temple activity. His actions that day created a chance to reflect and reset and called attention to a system which was hindering people's efforts, actually preventing them from connecting with God in a meaningful way. What does that mean for us? Our lives at times can become like that temple. We start out well. When God first begins to work in our lives, we're zealous. We're full of grace and gratitude. We're excited about the things of God and eager to develop a relationship with Him through worship and prayer and service and fellowship. We want to see the world transformed. We want to be agents of change. We're eager to reach out and lead others to Christ and to share the joy we have come to know as children of God. And others see the change in us. But sometimes, over time, things begin to change. Sometimes we find ourselves trying to be faithful in the midst of day-to-day -day living, and the newness begins to fade. The cares of life, the pressures of work, the pursuit of wealth and happiness begin to erode all that zeal we had for our God. And trying to fit it all into a 24-hour day, we sometimes make compromises that at first, like the goings-on in the temple, appear to be just expedient, efficient, or accommodating. But slowly over time, they begin to erode 
and interfere with that connection to God. And soon, like the temple itself, we can become people with an outward form of godliness, but one that has lost its power in our lives. So how do we prevent that from happening? Jesus, I believe, gives us a pattern. And we must, like him, drive from our lives that which stands in the way of our connection to God. To clean up those things which keep us from living a deep and rich life in God. And it's not just the obvious things, like bad habits or toxic relationships and recognizable sins. In fact, some of the things we must examine may have at one time been good things, maybe even beneficial things to our own relationship to God, drawing us closer, but now have lost their power to connect. Take, for example, something like our worship. Here this morning, we are online, and it is a good thing to be able to meet as a church in a virtual environment, comfortably in our living rooms, free from fear of contracting COVID. All of that is very good. But it also offers an opportunity to participate in worship only when we want to. And then perhaps after some time, only when it's convenient. And then maybe over time, only to participate in those bits that are of interest or importance to us. And soon what was meant to connect us to God and to each other has eroded to a matter of expedience and convenience. And I'm not saying that any of this is happening. I just say that to point up that like the temple of Jesus' day, some of the things we create to facilitate or expedite our worship can become self-serving and actually begin over time to get in the way of our relationship with God. Another example that may hold us back is the idea of what our church should look like. All of us long to be back in our building on Sunday mornings. But our concept of what church has looked like in the past may keep us from seeking ways to connect ourselves and God in the present. Can our desire to return what we have been in the past blind us to the possibilities of the here and now? These things too, while good, may need to be cleaned out if we are to roll into the future as salt and light, as people of God. So what tools are available to us to help us reflect on our lives of faith and identify those things which may be shutting our relationship with God down as we emerge into this promise of a new year? Here again, I think Jesus, in our passage today, points the way. First of all, he talks about prayer. Prayer roots us in the mind and presence of God. It helps us to examine what is going on in life and to see what is leading us, um, what is leading us toward or away from God. If your prayer life needs a boost, one way to strengthen your prayer life is to pray through the book of Psalms, which is the Bible's prayer book. Another prayer practice that can be helpful is something that I practice, have practiced from time to time, which is fixed hour prayer. This is a practice that requires you to stop for a few minutes at different times of the day in the midst of the activities of the day in order to reconnect directly with God. The benefit of this is that it helps a person make sure that they don't fall into the trap of separating spiritual life from what we often refer to as real life. Jesus never makes that kind of a distinction, and we shouldn't either. Stopping periodically to be with God in the midst of the activities of the day helps us to connect what God is doing in the here and now with the day-to-day -day living that we do in the world. Beyond regular faithful prayer to keep us connected with God, our passage today also suggests that we maintain our zeal for God. The reason for this is that the active pursuit of God keeps us conscious of how God is intervening in our lives. Here our other spiritual disciplines are helpful. Worship, celebration, fellowship, walking in nature, giving, serving. All these things constantly call us to become aware 
of the acts of God in our day-to-day surroundings. And this awareness both strengthens our faith and reliance on God and helps us to better see the places in our lives where that connection might be lacking or becoming self-serving. Finally, we can clean out things that are hindering our connection to God through reaching out to others. In effect, we become temples of God's Spirit to shine His light into the lives of others in any place that we go. Pastor and spiritual writer Lillian Daniel, who is one of my favorite writers, calls this becoming the stand-in church. Here God calls us to stand in for the church among people who are in the midst of sadness and the cruelty and the craziness and the unpredictability of life and reassure them that what they think on most days that we are crazy to believe is in fact real and true. Doing that in an authentic way can only come from a place of faith rooted in our relationship with God and each other and from a place that is cleared from as many obstacles as possible to that relationship. But doing this routinely also exposes those obstacles and pushes us back into the arms of our Heavenly Father and reassures us and others that what we say we believe in is in fact real. What obstacles are hindering your relationship with God? How strong is your spiritual life? What priority to you, do you give to nurturing your relationship with God? And where have the forms that that relationship takes become self-serving? Jesus calls us today to examine that relationship and to clean out those things which hinder our connection with him. And in this way, we can become temples of the Holy Spirit, shining Christ's light into the world. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we invite you now, if you are participating with us in online communion, to go ahead and take out your home communion elements. If you choose not to participate in communion at this time, that is completely fine. We invite you to continue with us through the service. We have other things in store. And to just be prayerful during this time of our worship and coming together around the table of Christ. I invite you to pray. Let us pray. Holy God, we come to you with all that we have and all that we are. And we ask that by the power of your Spirit, you would just pour over us. That you would help us in many ways to see our wrongdoings. And allow Jesus, in some ways like he cleansed the temple so long ago, to cleanse our hearts. Lord, it's easy for us to look at others and name where they have gone astray. But in this time, through the power of your Spirit, help us to look at our own hearts and pour over us, Lord, with your healing grace. Remind us, Lord, that you take our sinfulness and you cast it as far as the east is from the west. And remind us that in the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. And help us, Lord, to turn to you that we might be nurtured and nourished in this time. We pray this prayer in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. And we are reminded this day that on the night when Jesus gave himself up for us, he took bread and he blessed it to his Father in heaven and he gave it to the disciples gathered there saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And on that very same night, he knew how the disciples would fail him, how they would fall short, but yet he took a cup and he blessed it to his heavenly Father and he gave it to the disciples gathered there saying, Take and drink of this, all of you. For this is the cup of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins 
Drink of this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, Lord, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves once more as a holy and living sacrifice in union with your spirit and in union with the strength of the body of Christ unleashed in the world. Pour over us this day, Lord, with your spirit and pour over our gifts before us now. Gifts of mere bread and juice. Make them be for us the true body and blood of Christ that we can live into our calling to be the family of Christ, the children of a mighty God, working to offer light and hope to a darkened world in need. Until that day when you call us all around your heavenly table and we feast in victory with you now and forevermore. All honor and praise is given to you, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Though our sins are many, they are forgiven and they were healed in the breaking of the body of Christ. Brothers and sisters in Christ, this is the body of Christ broken for all of us. Thanks be to God. And all is cleansed, all is washed away in the cup of salvation. This is the blood of Christ offered for all of us. Thanks be to God. Amen. And now we are always very bold to pray the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thou art the kingdom and the glory forevermore. Amen and amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, I invite you now to receive the gifts of the table of Christ. Go ahead and receive the body of Christ. This is the body of Christ given for you. And go ahead and receive the blood of Christ shed just for you. Thanks be to God. Let us offer our prayers of thanks. Holy God, for this precious gift, for the gift of yourself giving to us, we give you thanks. Pour over us now as you have poured over the gifts of your table that we might stand as witnesses to your grace even, Lord, when we fully do not understand what you are unfolding, that we would be strong witnesses to your good news at work in the world. We pray this prayer and we rise from this table, this connected table across the distance, to serve you faithfully in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen and amen. Why should I feel a discouraged? Why should the shadows come? Why should my heart be lonely and long for heaven home? When Jesus is constant friend is he, his eye is on a sparrow, and I know he watches me, 
Jesus has called us to examine ourselves and to look for those places in our relationship with him that maybe once were good things but are now hindering our connection to him, that he may continue to pour into us, that we may be a light to the world when in fact we go from this place and may become the only expression of the church others may see. Grant, Lord, that what has been said with our lips we may believe in our hearts, and that we believe in our heart, what we believe in our hearts we may practice in our lives through Jesus Christ our Lord. And now go in peace in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>